Humanities through classics, what does the future hold? Today, for the first time in Western history, studying the classics is no longer an act of obvious self-interest. I mean this in the most literal way possible. I'm not referring to our general belief in the humanizing effect of the classics, in the importance of the past for teaching lessons about the future, or for their role in making us more articulate and self-aware human beings. I am talking instead about the fact that from antiquity onwards until relatively recently, say a century and a half ago, the study of the classics was as important to success in the professional world as a business degree or a law degree might be today. This is because in the European past, the study of Latin in particular and of the artes liberales, of which it formed a part, was a significant guarantor of social mobility. Mastering Latin gave one a path into membership of the dominant socioeconomic groups of medieval and Renaissance culture. Latin schools existed to prepare one for university, and at the university, courses, of course, were also taught in Latin and enabled the children of the middle classes to rise above their birth, in particular if they wanted to pursue a career in the church. Latin was also the language of the government, of law, and of medicine. Its prestige such that the quack doctors of the French playwright Molière speak quack Latin to intimidate their patients. And you have an example there, Cabricius Archithurum, Catalamus Singulariter, Nominativo, Haec Musa, etc., etc. It means pretty much nothing. As late as 1807, when the British general John Whitelock failed to capture Buenos Aires, he surrendered in Latin because it was the only language that the officers on both sides understood. Even as Latin and Greek shrank to become the study of the classics rather than the core of education to court, they were still seen as the royal road to a career in government in the UK until the last century. And of course, if Latin was a lingua franca, Rome itself, and Greece as well, provided a model for the rule of others. As Sir Richard Livingstone's Defense of Classical Education put it in 1917, we must go to Rome for our lessons on how to govern people who differ in race, language, temper, and civilization, to raise and distribute armies for their defense or subjugation, to meet expenses civil and military, to allow generals and governors sufficient independence without losing control at the center. When we think of the classics today, however, we pull up a different set of values. That too is a historical development, one of the past century, in which the humanities in general came to mean a study that honed one's critical thinking, a form of knowledge for knowledge's sake, a source of ethical self-improvement. This was nowhere more true than in the classics, where many of these ethical values are represented in the texts that we read and the cultures that we study, from Aristotle's ethics to Athenian democracy, Herodotus's cultural relativism, and Virgil's ruminations on the cost of empire, Seneca's attention to the self, and of course, the quest for moral values outside the context of religion and monotheism. And if we argue that the humanities are ultimately a reflective pursuit, and then one in which we construct meaning rather than discover it, then the ancient world about which our knowledge is perforce limited by temporal and textual lacunae brings this fact home more clearly, perhaps, than any other field. The literal lacunae and papyri the fragmentary codices and ruins of buildings are a good metaphor for such gaps. To these points, we could also add other defenses of the value of the field, such as the fact that classics is internally cross-disciplinary, or the defense consisting in what is called 
faculty psychology, which is the idea that certain mental faculties, for example, memory and reasoning, could be exercised as if they were muscles, and that the study of the ancient languages provided the best all-round exercise of this sort. In her recent book, Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, Martha Nussbaum has argued that these qualities, whether in classics or again in the humanities in general, foster the kind of critical thinking and appreciation of difference that are basic to the success of democracy. We could find this slightly ironic given the view of ancient theorists of democracy, many of whom felt that direct democracy, at least, was the choice of the uneducated, the unself-reflective, and the urban mob, all of them prey to demagoguery. But in any case, as Nussbaum laments in her comments on Kenneth Dover in The New Republic, quote, the humanities are being asked on pain of extinction to refashion themselves as tools of profit, demonstrating the economic impact of their inquiries, end quote. The difficulty with all these arguments for the importance of the classics and the humanities is not that they are not true. They are absolutely true. But it is that we are preaching to the choir and that the choir these days is a very small group without powerful singers. If our enrollments are declining, if some universities, not Miami, thank goodness, are cutting their humanities departments or eliminating their classics departments, it is because fewer students are signing up for a field whose immediate productivity for their future isn't clear to them. Because these student bodies are now racially and economically diverse. And because higher education in this day is available to almost everyone and not just a small and privileged stratum of the population. Classics, in other words, can no longer be used to legitimate the social order which benefits from it the most. What are our options in such a situation? This is not an easy question to answer. I think we have to accept that we cannot bring back a world in which the classics and the humanities command immediate respect and indeed are necessary for individual advancement. I would not therefore agree with some recent assessments of what is happening in the field, such as that of John Ellis, who thinks that the humanities have been abandoned because they are jargon-filled <coughs> nonsense, and that if we restored them, to their more traditional topics, they would thrive again. So, as he writes, there was a time when save the humanities would have been an appropriate cry, but that was years ago when they were being dismantled in one department after another and replaced with the intellectual triviality and sheer boredom of endlessly repetitive Marxist identity politics as cowardly administrators looked on and did nothing etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and he points to, quote-unquote, elaborate jargon, being a laughing stock, and finally, the day of reckoning, that biblical arrival which we all quake in our shoes to think about. Nor do I take the view of Fred Donahue, who believes that the humanities can only survive outside the university, in novels, plays, the arts, or that critical thought comes already from just reading such things on one's own. I have already also indicated my skepticism about the view that the humanities and democracy naturally go hand in hand. After all, the Germans doused themselves in Schiller and Schopenhauer and all sorts of humanistic refinements and look at the good it did them. I think we have to figure out instead how to make the humanities and the classics among them once again the object of measurable benefits rather than abstract ones and I know this is in some ways a very terrible suggestion, but it's my attempt at being pragmatic rather than preaching to the choir. But how do we make clear their measurable benefits, however? I don't have any magic answers to that this afternoon, only a few set suggestions, perhaps by way of an introduction to this sort of thinking. For example, perhaps one thing we could do when we talk about the humanities is change our focus from how good they are for us as individuals 
to how good they could be in terms of improving larger social units, business corporations, political groups, diplomatic corps, and so forth. And we could do so by emphasizing the applicability of humanistic knowledge in broader schemes than some of the ones we are used to, such as teaching corporate sensitivity to other cultures and other ways of constructing ethical value, capitalizing on the new global environment we find ourselves in, the world is, after all, shrinking rapidly, which necessitates contact with others. Stressing language acquisition as a first, first path to understanding foreign cultures better. And perhaps even encouraging use of the humanities, qua secular endeavor, as a possible educational tool against radical fundamentalism. Whatever we do, we need to do something. Because when Socrates said that shoemaking was not an art, but a techne, a knack. He never foresaw the day when all of his students would be rushing off from their academies and lycea and gymnasia to join the corporate offices of Nike. Thank you very much. <laughs>